Hello everybody. In this video, I'd like to talk about why Simpson's rule is so effective. So in a previous video, we've seen that when you use quadratic approximations to estimate the signed area under a function, you're creating something called Simpson's rule. And when you use Simpson's rule with two end divisions, you're actually taking the weighted average one third the trapezoid sum with n divisions and two thirds the midpoint sum with n divisions. And in many instances, uh, Simpson's rule turns out to be wildly effective in coming up with a pretty good estimate of the signed area. So in this video, I'm going to try to address why this weighted average is so effective. And to do this, I'm, I'm going to take a different route than usual. You might call it experimental calculus. We're going to come up with some evidence in the lab, so to speak, that suggests what's going on. So imagine we have a function f that's concave up on the interval from x0 to x2, with x1 being the midpoint. And now, if we used a trapezoid to estimate this area, well, in this case, it's very clear that this estimate will be too large. And if we use the midpoint sum with one division here, um, we can draw this tangent line and see that a trapezoid with an equal amount of area here is going to be um, is going to have area smaller than the actual area under the curve. So we'll put that to the side there. So as long as the concavity doesn't change here, as long as it's concave up throughout this interval, we can see that the actual area is trapped between uh, an application of the midpoint sum with one division and application of the trapezoid sum with one division. Now, if the function f is concave down on that same interval, then the roles of the trapezoid and midpoint sums are going to be reversed. The trapezoid sum is going to be too small and the midpoint sum is going to be too large. So if the concavity of f does not change on the interval, then the actual area is guaranteed to lie between the trapezoid and midpoint sums. Now, if you have a general function that isn't wiggling around too violently, then a modest number of divisions of the interval on which you care about this function will probably give you a situation like this. So if the concavity doesn't change that often, it doesn't take too many divisions to get this kind of behavior. Now, perhaps because one of these is guaranteed to be too large and one's too small, some sort of average of the two will yield a good estimate of the true area. Here's where we'll get experimental. We're going to look at four functions, cosine x, e to the negative x, secant x, and square root of x plus one. And we're going to work with them on the same interval from zero to one. Now you notice I've chosen examples here where the concavity uh, does not change. In the first case, it's always concave down, second case, concave up, third case, concave up, and fourth case, concave down. We're going to calculate a bunch of quantities for each of these examples. We'll calculate the actual area, We'll calculate the trapezoid sum, which takes a particularly nice form in this case. You're just going to average the function heights at either endpoint and uh, the interval width being one, that's all it takes. We will calculate the midpoint sum, which again, because the interval width is one, just amounts to evaluating f of a half. Then we'll find the trapezoid error. We'll take the actual value, we'll subtract off what the trapezoid sum gave us. And you can see a picture of the trapezoid error here, these sort of, um, slivers, and then we'll look at the midpoint error, which is we'll take the actual value, we'll subtract off the midpoint sum, and you'll notice that the midpoint errors, already you have a sort of feel for the fact that the midpoint errors are more slivery than the trapezoid errors we just looked at a moment ago. Um, they're sort of very thin in the end, uh, in the middle, and they flare out a little at the ends, but we have this visual impression that perhaps the midpoint errors are uh, smaller than the trapezoid errors. And then finally, we'll calculate the ratio of the midpoint error to the trapezoid error. Here we go, giant table. We're just gonna crank all of these out. Use your favorite tool, online utility, to crank these out numerically, a graphing calculator, whatever it takes. But here we go. We've got the cosine function. The actual area is about 0.84147. Then we're gonna calculate the trapezoid sum which is clearly smaller. Then we'll calculate the midpoint sum, which is a little bit larger. And now we'll calculate the midpoint error, 
and we're taking the actual area and we're subtracting off the midpoint sum and since the midpoint sum is a little too large we're getting a negative error here and then we're going to calculate the trapezoid error which is a positive error because the trapezoid sum is too small and when we take the actual error minus the trapezoid sum we're going to get a positive number trapezoid sum is too small midpoint sum is too big and these errors have opposite signs because of that and now finally we're going to take the quotient of the midpoint error of the trapezoid error we got about negative 0.50633 one thing to notice here is this is close to negative a half we're going to keep our eye on this throughout these examples on to e to the negative x actual value trapezoid sum too large in this case the midpoint sum is going to be too small in this case the midpoint error being positive this time and the trapezoid error being negative this time these these uh, differences of signs you know we've seen why uh, one of these will be too large one of them will be too small and that's why we're getting different signs for the errors and this ratio is about negative 0.49383 and you can fill out the details uh, good exercise just try doing this yourself um, and a few things to notice because the concavity did not change in any of these examples across the interval from 0 to 1 you can see that the trapezoid error and the midpoint error they have opposite signs one is always too large one is always too small and the other thing to notice is that the ratio of the midpoint error to the trapezoid error is pretty near it's in the ballpark of negative one half every time so there's our experimental observation if you take the ratio of the midpoint error to the trapezoid error you roughly get about negative one half now at this point you might ask yourself if the midpoint error is always half the error of the trapezoid error why bother with the trapezoid sum at all why not just use the midpoint sum but in fact if you think about this for a second this is telling you how to mitigate the tendency for the midpoint sum and for that matter the trapezoid sum to either over or underestimate the actual area if they're always on different sides of the actual area we should be able to exploit this fact to come up with a nice average that puts us right around the actual value so here's what we'll do we'll start with this um, approximate equality and we'll solve for the trapezoid error so we expect roughly the trapezoid error to be about negative two times the midpoint error now what is the trapezoid error it's the difference in the actual area i.e. the integral of f from a to b minus the trapezoid sum and what's the midpoint error well it's the actual area minus the midpoint sum and now what we can do with this is we can actually solve for the integral once we add the correct quantities of both sides we're going to get three times the integral is equal to the trapezoid sum plus twice the midpoint sum and then divide by three and there you have it we have empirical evidence to suggest that a relatively good approximation to the definite integral is this weighted average one-third the trapezoid sum within divisions plus two-thirds the midpoint sum within divisions and as we've seen that is exactly what simpson's rule with two n divisions is giving you